the only function of the government in such a society is the task of protecting man's rights, that is, the task of protecting him from physical force. The government acts as the agent of man's right of self-defense and may use force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. Thus, the government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of force under objective control. It is the basic metaphysical fact of man's nature, the connection between his survival and his use of reason, that capitalism recognizes and protects. In a capitalist society, all human relationships are voluntary. Men are free to cooperate or not, to deal with one another or not, as their own individual judgments, convictions, and interests dictate. They can deal with one another only in terms of and by means of reason, that is, by means of discussion, persuasion, and contractual agreement by a voluntary choice to mutual benefit. The right to agree with others is not a problem in any society. It is the right to disagree that is crucial. It is the institution of private property that protects and implements the right to disagree and thus keeps the road open to man's most valuable attribute, the creative mind. This is the cardinal difference between capitalism and any form of collectivism. The moral justification of capitalism does not lie in the altruist claim that it represents the best way to achieve the common good. It is true that capitalism does, if that catchphrase has any meaning, but this is merely a secondary consequence. The moral justification of capitalism lies in the fact that it is the only system consonant with man's rational nature, that it protects man's survival qua men, and that its ruling principle is justice. Every social system is based explicitly or implicitly on some theory of ethics. The tribal notion of the common good has served as the moral justification of most social systems and of all tyrannies in history. The degree of a society's enslavement or freedom corresponded to the degree to which that tribal slogan was invoked or ignored. The common good, or the public interest, is an undefined and undefinable concept. There is no such entity as the tribe or the public. The tribe or the public or society is only a number of individual men. Nothing can be good for the tribe as such. Good and value pertain only to a living organism, to an individual living organism, not to a disembodied aggregate of relationships. When the common good of a society is regarded as something apart from and superior to the individual good of its members, it means that the good of some men takes precedence over the good of others, with those others consigned to the status of sacrificial animals. What makes the victims accepted and permits a society to perpetrate a moral atrocity of that kind? The answer lies in philosophy in philosophical theories on the nature of moral values. There are, in essence, three schools of thought on the nature of the good, the intrinsic, the subjective, and the objective. 
the intrinsic theory holds that the good is inherent in certain things or actions as such, regardless of their context and consequences, regardless of any benefit or injuries they may cause to the actors and subjects involved. It is a theory that divorces the concept of good from beneficiaries and the concept of value from valuer and purpose, claiming that the good is good in, by, and of itself. The subjective theory holds that the good bears no relation to the facts of reality, that it is the product of a man's consciousness, created by his feelings, desires, intuitions, or whims, and that it is merely an arbitrary postulate or an emotional commitment. The intrinsic theory holds that the good resides in some sort of reality independent of man's consciousness. The subjective theory holds that the good resides in man's consciousness independent of reality. The objective theory holds that the good is neither an attribute of things in themselves nor of man's emotional states, but an evaluation of the facts of reality by man's consciousness according to a rational standard of value. Rational in this context means derived from the facts of reality and validated by a process of reason. The objective theory holds that the good is an aspect of reality in relation to man and that it must be discovered, not invented, by man. Fundamental to an objective theory of values is the question of value to whom and for what. An objective theory does not permit context dropping or concept stealing. It does not permit the separation of value from purpose, of the good from beneficiaries, and of man's actions from reason. Of all the social systems in mankind's history, Capitalism is the only system based on an objective theory of values. The intrinsic theory and the subjectivist theory, or a mixture of both, are the necessary base of every dictatorship, tyranny, or variant of the absolute state. Whether they are held consciously or subconsciously, in the explicit form of a philosopher's treatise, or in the implicit chaos of its echoes in an average man's feelings. These theories make it possible for a man to believe that the good is independent of man's mind and can be achieved by physical force. If a man believes that the good is intrinsic in certain actions, he will not hesitate to force others to perform them. If he believes that the human benefit or injury caused by such actions is of no significance, he will regard a sea of blood as of no significance. If he believes that the beneficiaries of such actions are irrelevant or interchangeable, he will regard wholesale slaughter as his moral duty in the service of a, quote, higher good, unquote. It is the intrinsic theory of values that produces a Robespierre, a Lenin, a Stalin, or a Hitler. It is not an accident that Eichmann was a Kantian. <laughs>